Today's talk is what's new in Colonel Shark 2, and the reason why I submitted it, because I like the rhyme. Um, ooh, is this thing not on? There, it would help if I turn the thing on. There we go. So, what is Colonel Shark? Whether or not you guys know what it is, I'm expecting you probably do know what it is if you're coming to this talk, if you want to know what's happening with number two, but I will go on. It's a front-end GUI inter, uh, utility for trace command. I'm not going to talk about what trace command is because that's a front-end command line interface for ftrace. Ftrace is a kernel tr uh, tracer inside the Linux kernel. The, um, it basically, what it does is it shows plots of CPU events where each task is a different color, so you can see where the tasks are. You, and it also has plots of tasks where the color changes depending on what CPU that task happens to be running on. It, below the graph, it shows a list of events where you can map the events to the little ticks on the graph. So I want to go back to a little history of Kernel Shark. It was created in December of 2009, so it's over a decade old. I mean, that, was, that makes it almost 12 years old now. It's a couple more months. <clears throat> it was originally written in GTK version 2. Um, it was mostly used to debug the scheduler because with this graph, you could debug the scheduler and there's a nice little article that I wrote on LWN um, using Kernel Shark to analyze the real-time scheduler. But the problem with this was it was maintained as a idle task. Now, what does that mean? It means that I was never told to create Kernel Shark. I was never in my career to say, okay, maintain, kernel shark, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So whenever I had nothing else to work on, I worked on kernel shark. So that was how it was developed. And this is what it looked like back then. This is the GTK version of kernel shark. You can see the lines, uh, the little ticks, the graphs is each CPU, each color is a task. Down below it is the task, and each C color is a um, different CPU. When there's, no, when there's nothing there, it means the system is idle. Either the, the task is not running or on the CPU, it's in idle. Uh, you could do little markers on it and you could, there was a marker A and a marker B and when you connected to, you see the delta between it. But the problem was it really needed some loving. It, like I said, I, I developed it without really focusing on it. I worked on it in my spare time, so which means that when I added a feature, it was rushed. I really didn't do much to it. And I kind of programmed myself into a corner. I made some really poor design decisions that made it really difficult to update it. And when I was starting, the more I did, I was adding more hacks on top of hacks on top of hacks, and it was really getting ugly. It was also extremely slow. When you zoomed in, it could take a long time because it used, you know, ON algorithms to determine the drawings. And it had a really strange and archaic um, interface that was totally non-conventional. Uh, so it was really not as intuitive to use, although I heard a lot of people still, I still see people using the GTK version, which I'm kind of laughing at. So it was useful to a lot of people. So then in 2017, I joined VMware. Well, how is that relevant? Well, VMware was trying to make an impact in open source community. They my job at VMware was basically to help VMware to become an open source friendly company. And they said, hey, Steve, do you have anything that you could work on that could be helped out? Same, a little while ago, I got someone else, uh, Jordan uh, Kodorjov, uh, joined, I, I know I mispronounced his last name, he gets mad at me for doing that, but uh, he joined VMware at the same year later on. So we said, hey, Let's give a, de a, de developer, a developer the task to work on Kernel Shark. Jordan said to me, I don't know GTK, never used it. But he knew Qt, or Qt. I, so. And because GTK 2.0 was deprecated and it really needed to be rewritten in GTK 3, I said, well, GTK is notorious for not being backwards compatible and I'm getting sick and tired of it, and I didn't want to write it GTK3, and then maybe years when GTK4 comes out, I have to rewrite everything again. So since it had to be rewritten, I told him, hey, you know Q? Go ahead, have at it. And in 2019, uh, Jordan came out with the finished completed version of Kernel Shark 1.0. 
And this is the cute version. Looks a little prettier if you ask me, but basically the same. And that was because the uh, 1.0 version, we said once Qt gets to the level of handling all the features of GTK version, then we'll release 1.0. That was the milestone. Once it's equal to the GTK version, we'll call it Kernel Shark 1.0, because before that, Kernel Shark was 0 0.0.9. So, Yordan did more than what I tasked him to. I just told him, go ahead and do the GTK features. But he really, really looked at the design and he created an abstraction layer between, before Kernel Shark was just an interface to trace command. Now it just is an interface for what it displays. And trace command, which creates a trace.dat file, is a lower layer that feeds into an upper layer and that feeds into the graphs. He also included ways to save sessions. So if you're in the middle of doing something and you say, or if you're like at a point where this is like, I want to, I want to get back to this spot. Because you're zooming in, zooming out, you might lose. It was hard to keep track of. You could go and say, save this session. And he also used more conventional uh, interfaces for zooming in, zooming out, moving the graph around. So it was more intuitive to people who understood GUI interfaces. And most importantly, he threw away the O, uh, big, uh, the big O and log uh, algorithms and made it into a log N algorithm. So the old way, this is GTK version, when it drew these lines, it would actually search, it would go right down the data path, and at every single event, it would draw a line. Well, actually, it would say, it will look at the pixels, it will do a division by how many events, by how many pixels are there, and when it got to a new pixel, it says, okay, draw a line, then search for the next, uh, uh, the time that would be at the next pixel. So he searched the events in a linear order until it found that one and then drew a line, and then it searched the next one and, found, and then drew a line, and so on and so forth. So, this was approximately 873 pixels for this timeline. So it looked at, you could say, average of 27 events, because you know, 23,891 divided by 873 is 27. So it looked at 27 events for each before it got to the next line. Now what Jordan said was, this is a waste of time, because why don't we just search for it? So if we have 23,000 events, and he knows what the time of what the next pixel is, because it might not have any event in the next pixel. So he would draw the one line, and then he did a binary search of the whole data path to find the, ele the event that belongs at that next pixel, and he draws the line there. And then he did a binary, so each one of these lines did a binary search. So using the same 23,000 events with 873 pixels, it looked at, approximately 15 events, not 27, 15 events, smaller for each pixel. And I know this because two to the 15 would be the binary search is greater than the twice, uh, actually I, did. I have a typo there, it says 27, it's supposed to be 23,000. So a total of a third, so I multiplied 873 by two to the 15, or not two to the 15, but 15 events, 873 times 15 is 13,000 events, instead of looking at the entire events. That's, yeah, it looks like a little bit of an increase. Well, let's look at 8 million events. So in the linear, alg uh, linear algorithm, you know, each pixel, we looked at nine, over 9,000 events to draw that next pixel. When I did this, I, like, I changed the size. To change the size or to recalculate drawing, it takes about three seconds to draw this. The O log N version of this looked at about 23 events, not 9,000, 23 events. Less than that. So it was much, it was actually much quicker to do that. And once he did that, like I said, here, total of 20,000 events to draw this instead of 8 million. And because it was so quick, he was able to do, like you could scroll in and scroll out. And if I get time to do a demo here, I will show you that you could scroll in and scroll out and you actually could zoom in and zoom out smoothly. So the abstraction layer of this is he had this buffer that he called buckets, and for each bucket is the event, for, uh, where it basically represents a pixel. And he would load the trace data into this, this abstraction layer, only recording the information it needed to draw the, the graph. 
So each of these little lines are pointing to information in this abstraction layer, which means, by the way, that this abstraction layer is, means that it could look at anything. It doesn't have to be traced at that file. We actually have code to look at perf data, and we also have code that looks at the you know, ESXi, VMware's proprietary data and all that. Uh, the list information, since it shows everything and shows all the information in the data, this actually goes directly to the trace file. You need to have an interface that says, okay, to draw the list, I need to go directly to the trace.dat file. What's really nice about sessions, though, is you could save and restore where you left off. You can restore the last session. You can save multiple sessions and then retrieve them later. So here, if I like this, I just go, oh, say if I open up, open this up. That's right. If I open up uh, Kernel Shark and go to File Sessions, Restore Last Set or Restore se or Request Import Session. That's it. I can't see. I have to take my glasses off so I can see. Gives you a window. You can pick. It's a JSON file. And then, boom, it takes you right where you left off. You can do this from the command line as well. You could say, OK, Kernel Shark dash S, pass in the file, and it'll open up Kernel Shark right where you want to start it. And say if you're using Kernel Shark and you close it and you're like, oh, wait, I want to go back to where I left off, you could do Kernel Shark dash L, which is you know, last, and it'll bring you back right where you left off. So, Kernel Shark 1.0 also introduced the idea of plugins. This is something I was actually saying that need, GTK version needed for a long time, but I never got to it. It was hard coded. Everything that the GTK version was set by me writing code, and that's it. You, you know, what you see is what you get. The V1 added plugins, which the two plugins I mentioned here is one that plots some special functionality is added by the plugins. And one of the other things that we add missed events. And I'll talk about this. So when you looked at the task of GTK version, so these are all the tasks. I have a migrate test, which the migrate function here, I think I used in my article for LWN, which runs a bunch of tasks and it forces migration. And you can see how things migrate around depending on priorities. And I use this because this is one of the things that Kernel Shark really shows well. And the top level, the one task, because different colors, it remembers, shows the migration. Different colors are different CPUs, because these are all tasks. To the left, they're called all the migrate threads that are running. And each color is when it got pushed off to another CPU, that's you could see there. And I could select one time, but this is what it looks like. And when it gets, when a task gets preempted, if it schedules out where that green line is in the beginning, right, here, this guy scheduled out because it's blank here, supposedly. And then over here, it was preempted. It switched to a CPU, switched to another CPU. And here, this red line means that it wanted to run, but it was kicked off the CPU by something else. And something else ran. Probably one of these guys because that's the same color right there. And yeah, then this guy took over there. And then it ran here. So you could see how it was kicked off and it wanted to run, but something else came in. The green little line means that this guy woke up at this moment, and this is the green man woke up. It's on the run queue, and when it turns solid, it means it's on the it's on the actual CPU. This is the Qt version of that exact same data, which is kind of interesting because I noticed that here it shows that it actually scheduled out, and it was a bug in the GTK version. It should have been red there. It actually wanted to run, and it wasn't. Where the GT, this version, it actually wanted to run this whole entire time. It was just getting forced out. So the GTK version had a bug. But this is a sked with a plugin. That means that this isn't the code that does this is not actually in the Kernel Shark proper. It's actually a plugin that when you download Kernel Shark source code, it comes with the source code. And when you install it, it's automatically installed. So it's there when you see it. You won't notice it's a plugin because it comes with the features. But it was added as a plugin to extend Kernel Shark. And you could disable the plugin, and which I did, and then it disappeared. Those, this is what it looks like without the plugin. Notice something here? When I was running this, I thought this might have been a bug in the plugin. <laughs> when I'm like, what the hell? Why did that thing disappear? So I had to investigate. Because that line, you saw that. It was something here, and then something disappeared. And what happens is, I clicked on that line that disappeared. If you look down here, you'll notice that the task running is some pool GSD smart TCC. Um, this is not the task that was being, this is not the migrate test. So this guy 
wouldn't be traced normally. But the plugin says trace it because if you look down here, this line, it actually is the sked switch event and it sked switched and it woke up the migrate task. So that normally this wouldn't be traced because when you trace a, or if you want to show the event, you're looking at all the events that happen under that event. But a sked switch, the one that actually records that is the previous event, not the event that got switched to. So the guy that was running here did the event and the sked plugin caught that saying, oh, we want to print, we want to include this in our work. So you actually got to see it get scheduled back in. Missed events is nice because you see all these blanks here. You might say, oh, this must be not running. Well, I ran the function tracer, which basically is a fire hose into the ring buffer and it's really hard to, for the reader to keep up with the writer and it drops tons of events. And if you're looking at visually, you kind of want to know about those events. So we created a missed event plugin that creates these little flags whenever there's telling you that there's enough, there's these events you don't know. It may look blank, but, or the fact that there's events missing. And if you click on it, it tells you, and it also tells you there's 2,900 events that missed. So what about Colonel Shark V2? Heck, that's the name of this talk. <laughs> Here, finally, you know, we're getting to hear enough of Colonel Shark V1. That's not what this talk is about, but I'm hoping that was useful. Um, it, we needed to do more features that the API for the plugins weren't that great. So we actually had to rewrite the code for the plugins, not we, Jordan. So it's not quite, the plugins for 2.0 are not quite compatible with 1.0. I'm someone who's really big into backward compatibility, but since I didn't see many people writing plugins, I was like, I don't think we're going to hurt anyone if we do this update. So risk and versus reward. The risk is we might break someone's plugins, but I haven't heard of anyone writing plugins for the V1 kernel shark. So let's, re let's break the API so that we could have a better interface and add it to V2. These plugins are even more flexible and can do a hell of a lot more. It could be associated to different streams from different files. And this is what makes Kernel Shark special. One of the new plugins, and I'm going to just talk about the plugins, because really the whole rewrite of Kernel Shark 2 was implementing these plugin facility. That's basically all Kernel Shark 2 was created new plugins and also added a few minor features, but the plugins is basically mostly what it is. And, and we included some nice plugins, and we're hoping that people might write more plugins. So there's the event field plugin which shows the maximum minimum as a marker. So if you want to see the maximum value of a field in event, this will allow you to see it. Or you could do the opposite. I want to see the minimum value as an event. And it creates a little graph above the graph with little lines that you could look to. So I go into Kernel Shark and under tools, you'll see plot event uh, field. And if you download Kernel Shark from kernel.org and install it. It's got the default is Kernel Shark 2, and you do your make, install, and install that. It will include the plugin. So you may not even notice that plugins are added. It should add them automatically for you. This pops up. And what I did was okay, I'm using the data stream as the file that I'm reading, which is this trace guest net. It's a guest network thing. And I want to say, I want to look at this event called kmemcache alloc. kmemcache alloc is one of the allocation mechanisms within the Linux kernel to, that allocates memory. And I want to say, let me plot the fields of bytes alloc. That's how much memory that this event actually allocated. And this is what I get. And you'll notice that above the little line, you'll see this line that has a little graph that shows you these green things here are the, are the maximum values. And everything here is a little uh, tick of how much was allocated. So I kind of zoomed in one, and I took a couple zooms. I only have one thing. So you, you select your mouse, you move it to the right, and it will zoom. And then when you let go, it zooms in nicely. And I zoomed in a few more to find this guy. And right there, you can't really see the bar on that because the marker on top of it is over the bar. But there's another green one here. And you'll see this guy allocated. It was here, couch, alloc, and did I lose? Ah! I can't believe I cut off the how much it allocated. I was supposed to talk about that and didn't even check my um, screenshot. But if we have time for a demo, I could demo it. The latency plugin is another thing 
that's similar to the event plugin, but it takes two events. And you can select a field between these two events that they map, that would map each to each other. So if this field has a value that matches the field of the event two, it's going to select these two guys. And it will show you the difference in time between those two events. So I go here and I select plot latency. Oops, is that right? Yep. And it gives me this graph, this dialog, which I, all this is developed by the plugin. The plugin, this is the plugin defined the dialog, it defined all this. And hopefully in the future we'll have a tutorial on how to write plugins. And I looked at sked waking, which is when the event is, or when a task is woken up, the sked waking event is triggered. With the PID of the, the PID field down here is the process ID of the task that's being woken up. And then I go over here and I say select sked switch event, which is the event that's triggered when one process schedules out and another process is scheduled in. And I'm, next PID is the process ID of the task that gets scheduled in. So basically, I want to see the time between when a task was woken up and when it ran on the CPU. And I get this. Now, I didn't zoom in. Uh, this is kind of funny because these lines down here, this is the, I think I ran the, the, the migrate test, and they all run at real-time priorities. And you've noticed this line here and the gap here and a gap here. Okay, real quick, anyone know what those gaps are for, from? Yes. Yes, on the real, no, it's, no it's, on the, it's on normal kernel, but they're real-time tasks. The real-time task is the hint. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. So what this is, is the RT throttle kicking in. This is using, the RT throttle is a utility, a safeguard in the Linux kernel that have a, if real-time tasks run for more than the time listed in the kernel, which is by default, uh, I think it's 950 milliseconds. If it runs for 950 milliseconds in one second, so 950 out of 1,000, it's going to throttle those tasks, and they're not going to run for five milliseconds, and then they'll be able to run again. This allows non-real-time tasks to get onto the CPU, because the real-time tasks will never allow a non-real-time task to ever score. So this, if you actually put the measurements here, that's five milliseconds. And, and you get to visualize that. That's why it's happening. It's triggering on all CPUs. Throttle, throttle, throttle. And right here, if you look above this, 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 the, the guys where, uh, this one, what, 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 it got preempted, but there was a one, ah, here, this green one, see, red means it was just preempted. It wanted to be on, the, it wanted to be, it wasn't preempted, it was just throttled. The red means it wanted to run, but couldn't. So that's not part of my latency. But down here, this guy got woken up at the beginning of the throttling, and then it was scheduled in here, and that's why you see this huge spike and here it happened again, a huge spike. So this guy, and this one, it didn't, there's no green bar, so it didn't get woken up. Here's one where there's a green thing where it got woken up, huge spike. So you could see that in the graphic, you could find where in the graph that something visualized, that's a maximum. And then you could zoom in and look at the trace events to figure out what actually happened. Now, tracing between host and guest. So this actually requires trace command 3.0, which is, has not been released yet, but the development code is in the Git tree. So if you go to the Git tree, there's no tag for this, but you could download the uh, trace command Git. Uh, 295 has the functionality for it, but doesn't have all the things you need. So if you want to play with this, you need the 3.0. So you run an agent on the guest, and then on the host, you could actually tell the guest to well, this actually works. The, between the agent and guest, you actually tell the guest to execute something. But what's not in 3.0, or what 3.0 is required in 3.0 is the time synchronization. The time synchronization algorithms to synchronize between host and guest is in 3.0, where just the communication level is in 295. So on the guest, I say, okay, trace command agent. And then on the host, I do trace command record. Well, so I'm going to record to a file. I'm recording the events, the KVM, all KVM events, all scheduling events, all networking events, and interrupt event, or IRQ events and IRQ vectors. So interrupts are happening all on the host. And then dash capital A means agent. This is the VSOC ID for the guest. 
which is uh, channel three, port 823, 823, because that's my birthday, um, dash E, uh, I'm telling to record all events on the guest. So the event, the guest is going to record all events, but on the host, I'm only going to record these events. So, like I said, that's the, I highlighted this because I didn't know if my mouse would be able to work. Then I moved the, the trace data because uh, there is code if it knows, there's some, depending on what utility you are to run the guest, you can actually put in the guest name and it can usually find what the guest name. So if I had my guest called, you know, Goliath, I could put dash a Goliath and it should find it if it's, if it can, but sometimes if it can't, you have to actually put in the, uh, the VSOC ID. And if you put the VSOC in ID, it will give you dash three. If you put in a name, it actually, the trace file for the guest will be the, the name of the guest. So I just moved it to guest. Actually, this, I changed it. I did, ran this a couple times, and the second time I ran it guest dash net. So actually, the, the screenshots are probably going to be for dash net. But you get the idea. Then I ran kernel shark with trace data, and I'm using the command. You could do this from the, um, from the menus driven. So you could say file append, which will do this. But I did the command line. What I did was kernel shark, the main host data first, so trace host. I'm appending the trace guests as this is telling kernel shark that this guy kind of is dependent on this one. And then this is what comes up. The, this here is the eight CPUs of the host. I had to scroll down, so you're missing CPU one because it's up here. And because I wanted to show CPU, the two CPUs of the guest. Not much useful information there, but it's nice to see it together. And they're time synchronized. So these events are actually synchronized with this. It actually uses the KVM hardware clock to uh, say, look at the offsets and figure out what the actual event mappings are. So it, it doesn't do it while the recording happens. It just says this time is, it maps to this time. Then I go and I say plot KVM plots. And I go here and I say, it shows you Okay, host, guest, and if you have multiple guests, it'll be a scroll down for multiple guests. And then I select the two CPU, or the, the CPU one and two, and it gives me this. I did some cleanup. This is, I removed the CPUs. I removed all the CPUs from the other host and guest. I didn't want them. And I selected the uh, wget uh, that I used for, on the host and the nginx uh, web server that I was running to trace. Uh, I grabbed, I said, trace, these are all the guests. And then you'll notice this combo here. This is the guest CPU zero. On um, This is the thread on the host that acts as the uh, agent on the guest. So basically what happens is, you know, when a guest virtual CPU is running, it really has to be represented by a thread or something on the host. So the host thread that's running for the guest is it, it determines, finds out what that is, and here it is. So this is the host thread, or host task, and this is the host task with CPU zero and one below it. Now, if you zoom in, you get to see some really nice information. And I even did some clicks here. So this, to show you here, this is on the host. It woke up here, scheduled in, and it's these little lines that go up and down and up and down. This is when there's a KVM enter, goes here, and then KVM exit. And this shows you that uh, whenever you see this funky thing, means that the thread, the guest virtual CPU is scheduled, but it's in host context. So that's why you see all the events that happen on the host scheduled back to the guest. The guest events happen, scheduled back down to the host events. And if I wanted to click here, I could click when did the interrupt come in. It's like this guy was when I woke up. And by the way, when I click this, it automatically does the second marker. There's a marker A, B, and it tells you the delta. So when I clicked on this guy, it showed you how long it took to, to uh, wake up. So this event happened, and you see that the host, it's interesting that the here, there was no events going on. It's scheduled to the guest, but there's nothing going on, and then it's scheduled back to the host. But then that's probably because it said, oh, we have nothing to do, scheduled the guest. But then an interrupt happened on the host, and then it's scheduled back to the host, because a lot of these things are interrupts that are happening within the host. So, in summary, 
Chrome Shark 2 is much more flexible now. We're looking for more plugins to add to it, uh, allow others to extend the interface, and hoping, as always, patch is welcome. So thank you. And if I don't know if I have time or not, how much is that over? Or do I have time? Am I early? Good? Screw it. Let's. So. I don't even know what, oh, it's right here. This is empty. So let's see if it crashes. Open trace file, uh, traces. What's a good one? Oh, my, my great one. So there it is, much quicker. You can zoom in, whoops, control, zoom in, zoom out. Uh, yeah, this will be this, let me move the, and this is where I said, if I click here, and I go up to marker B, click here, it's five milliseconds. So that's how you can see. see. Um, let me zoom in here just to take a look at it. Uh, and I'll quit. Then I'll do kernel shark dash A, or no, L, which means bring me back to the last place where I just left off. So that's really a nice feature. Uh, let me see here. I get append trace files, sessions, sessions, uh, import session. Uh, let's see. I think I had one latency. Do I have anything with the G2? Two lines. Oh, shoot. Maybe. Uh, I'll just pick that one. Heck of it. I have no idea what it is. Oh, we went to this screen here. Uh, but that, oh, this is where I want. Yeah, this is where the CPU is. So, whoops. Now, that was a bug. <laughs> that happened once. Minus. Oh, oh where would that happen? Yeah, so, oh, I somehow lost the marker, that's why. But let me zoom in again. Zoom in again. Zoom in again. Uh, just double click here. And what's the, how it, when I double clicked, it knew that this is a wake up event. So I'll automatically select the sketch switch event. So it showed you right there, and you get to see the uh, time, which is what, 26 um, microseconds to wake up. Not too bad. And I go, like, remember I said, what the heck is going on here? I don't really know. So I'm just clicking here. And down here, it's like KVM 8-pick. Oh, it's maybe, oh, it's a page full. So it's actually emulating an instruction that the guest did. So it jumped to the guest. There was no events that was being traced. But it did something that w the guest wasn't allowed to do in guest context. So it faulted, went to KVM. Uh, went to, yeah, and then KVM emulated it for the guest and then went back. That's why you can see, and you can even see what, I don't know what this instruction is, but it shows you the instruction that it emulated. So, questions? Yes. Oh, the different colors. Oh, the different colors. Uh, oh, like I said, it's um, actually a good thing. Let me zoom back out. So the different colors, I said, what it means is it depends on if it's a task or a, what's the word? If it's, this is a task, because it's a task with the process ID. So each color at the bar, the color here means it's a CPU. This red is actually, if I go onto the CPU where it's at, which I don't have plotted, let me go plot CPUs. Uh, the guess, what was it, CPU zero? Shoot, let me go find out which CPU it was. Um, this guy says up on top, yep, if you look up on top, I can't move the mouse. Um, way up here, you'll see CPU zero. That's, so CPU zero there. So if I plot CPU zero on the post, you'll notice it's red. And that's because, so right here, this red represents this task. So that's why the color ticks rep are the color of the task. So, and say if you find a case where, I don't know, like maybe right here, if you're saying, geez, these two colors don't look too good. If you could go up into tools, there is a color scheme oops, that you could actually change the colors. And it will change the scheme. It uses a hash table. So you could play around if you don't like it. If, like right now, I actually probably made it worse. So you could actually change the colors of what everything is. So every process ID just goes, throws to a hash table, and then it just could do, you know, red, the RGB, red, green, blue, cuts it, and says, that's the color. So nothing too sophisticated, but works really nice. Any other questions? With that, oh, wait, nope. Useful ones. <laughs> 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 
Um, yes, we have to make the tutorial. That's definitely on. There's so many things we want to do. And we realize like, oh, this will be great to write this tutorial. Oh, it's great to do this. Oh, it's great to do that. Then you realize, wait a minute, I need four of me. You know, <laughs> I think we all kind of understand that. So yes, if someone else wants to drive in and write a tutorial <laughs> and try it. So we're actually working for people to actually look at it. Sometimes when you're too much into the code, it's hard to explain it. So sometimes having someone work with you that, and then you that just ask you questions, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? You could probably create a better tutorial that way than us just, hey, I know how to do this. And I'll write it and then I'll say things that to me is obvious, but other people are like, what the heck are you talking about? So that's, we're all susceptible to that. But anyway, though, like I said, anything you can think of. I like the events, maybe play with the events differently. Maybe there's something else you want to do. Um, uh, one thing I might want to do is have more, like maybe add code to do something specific for when a trigger happens. Filtering. We need to filter. I just maybe want to filter tasks. Right now, I could filter it by just saying only on this task, stop the, uh, what's the word I want to say? Only on this task do I want to see the latency or something. But right now, I could actually just, I could go up and just say filter and just say I don't want to filter for like here's all the CPUs. I could say what tasks to show. You know, if I just do this, this should be interesting. Apply. They all go away. So I can actually just have certain tasks and I can plot certain tasks. And I can say, I just want to see the information on this task. So I can do the plot. That's how I have to do the filtering. But maybe have the event thing do a filtering or have something that's maybe easier or I don't know. I, I'm like basically, when we need a need, these are the things that I had a need for. So I asked Jordan, would you please write plugins for this? And he did. So I even need to learn how to write plugins because I'm not really good at it myself. So maybe I'm the person that needs to write the tutorial and say, hey, Jordan, how do you do this? Because most of this work is done by Jordan, pretty much all of it. So I don't want to take credit for this. I kind of help lead him and I help review the code and everything like that, but he's the one doing the code. He's doing a fantastic job. And he's in Bulgaria and couldn't come here to present this. <laughs> so if that's the question is, why are you presenting it and not him? There. And also I had to have an excuse to come here. Well, ideally, if it's not well suited to the bug, um, by the way, before we go on, I just want to say that if the event it doesn't exist, that it's clicked onto an event that's being filtered out, you notice the line turned dashed. That, Jordan actually thought of that. So um, it's really great on any scheduling utility. The scheduling folks that does not do all this dead, uh, the sched deadline and all that, they use Kernel Shark. I was an LPC for the scheduler. And Kernel Shark popped up a few. They just had just had a cut and a screenshot of the bar, and I'm like, that's Kernel Shark, you know. So it's used a lot in scheduling, folks, because you can really visualize how things are. But I'm trying to get it done for locking problems and a lot more other things. What else is it good for? What it's not good for? I sometimes don't. Well, I don't always use it unless I need a visual. But if I just want to trace something and debug something, I just go right into trace command and I usually can find it. But then when there's latency issues, I'm like, okay, this latency thing's new. So I haven't really gotten to use it yet because it's rather new. So now I plan on using it more. So that's why the more features it gets, the more it'll be used. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, yes. Well, there's a record feature, which won't work because I'm not, well, wait, I think it will. Now, I have to be careful. This is not, this is like a Debian kernel and, wait, what's, and there it goes. So it runs actually a different utility. Uh, it's not, this actually isn't kernel shark. It's actually a kernel shark plugin type of, not plugin, but a uh, helper. It's because we don't want thing. And now I could go in here, by the way, and say, uh, I don't know, here's the VSOX, but let's say, what's a good thing to, let me just kick off SCED. I could click, and let me turn off, let me just do SCED switch and SCED wake up. Hmm, which, 
and oops, wrong one. And wake up, wake up there. And let's see here. Plug in. Do I want function graph tracer or something? No, I'm not going to do it. Um, sleep one is the command. I could change it to ls. And you know, I haven't done this in some time, so I actually I don't think this is probably the first time I've done it with Kernel Shark two. So if it crashes, I'll blame you. But apply. So you can see it shows you the command that it does. It does trace command record, maybe, and capture. Oh, here it is. This just shows you what it's going to do. Then this, and there it is. It recorded it. And let's see if it works. There. Close that. And there's the record that I just did on this laptop. And I was a little worried because when I last time I did a trace on my laptop, I locked up my laptop. <laughs> it just, so I was like, don't walk up. <laughs> That's why I kind of limited to those two events because I didn't think they would be a problem. But I turned on all events and then the system. <laughs> so some driver or something use it. And this is a 510 kernel from Debian. So it may have a bug. So I didn't have time to debug that. So, and I, let me zoom back out. If that's, oh, it is zoomed out. So zoom all the way in. There we go. So, and there's also filter, there's an advanced filter that's really bad. TEP, that TEP is just trace event. Um, let's, I forgot what, uh, what the piece is. Trace event. Trace point? Oh. Um, but this is, I could go up here and filter on, it shows you, here's the events, sketch switch and insert, and this is like a type of thing that has that. This is my poor attempt at doing what Wireshark does, and I didn't do it well. <laughs> so this, I don't usually show this because I'm not um, proud of that one. But patch is welcome. Event. So hey, if you want to add more, you want to fix it, I suck at, I suck at UI. <laughs> so any other questions? Anything on Slack? GPU activity. So basically events from the GPU, only, it only shows events that are being traced. Now the GPU, if it's running, uh, okay, if you have trace, if you're able to extract events from the GPU and you write a plugin, by the way, the, uh, remember I showed you that there's a abstraction layer? We've actually made it in this code that the trace command is really a plugin. So the F trace work is just a plugin that feeds into kernel shark. So it's not even hard code anymore. That's a plugin that's done in. And now we have a perf plugin. So if you want to write a plugin for events, if you could extract events from the GPU and put it into a plugin, you could get all the visualization from that plugin. Because I said that's an abstraction layer. Anything else on? Yes. Well, if, it, if you had the trace output, by the way, I haven't tested it recently, but crash, you know the crash utility when the system locks up? Well, I mean, if the system's still running, you get a deadlock and the system's still running and you traced all the events up to it, yes, you could, trace, Ftrace could easily trace, uh, debug deadlocks because that's one of the reasons why Ftrace was created in the first place. It was part of, it came out of the real-time patch and we caused deadlocks all the time and Ftrace was used to debug that. So I don't know about curl shark, curl shark might help if you want to like the visualization of it, but the trace command and ftrace, and if your system's still running, great. If it crashes, it locks up, and if it locks up and it could still trigger a watchdog that would go into kexec and kdump, and you get a core file, you, there is a, a plugin, not my plugin, but a crash plugin that comes with crash called trace. So you load the trace plugin, and it will, it will extract the ftrace buffers from the core dump level and create a trace.dat file that could be read by trace command or kernel shark. And I've used that to debug um, customers' problems where they would trigger a bug, but we couldn't get their stuff. So they just tell them, enable all these events, and then they would give us a, it would lock up, crash, they get a core dump, they send it to me. I extracted the data, and then I brought up, you know, kernel shark and everything. And I was able to debug the customer's problem from that output. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. It's great to have a live audience. And I so miss that sound. <laughs>